Okay. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, my name is Jeff Trainer. I'm a solutions architect with Achieve Internet. Achieve, we're a Drupal engineering firm based out of San Diego and Los Angeles. Uh, my job is a solutions architect. Uh, in that role, I handle a lot of the onboarding of clients, project discoveries, um, work on wireframes, information architecture, these kind of things. Uh, a big part of my job is producing a lot of documentation. Uh, I used to be a site builder, uh, but these days I don't actually build any Drupal sites. Everything I do is on paper, uh, work with our development team. A uh, little bit of context here, maybe uh, something that kind of inspired this presentation. Um, my job title, Solutions Architect, is a little bit contentious in the trainer family household. Um, this lovely lady here, my wife, is a real architect. Uh, and I often have to attend dinner parties with friends and justify why I get to use the title architect uh, when they have to go through grad school and a series of professional licensing exams. But in our industry, you call yourself what you want. Um, but needless to say, I have had to defend uh, my title to these folks. And I think that there are a lot of parallels between what I do and what an architect does. Um, we look at one of the earliest definitions of what architecture is. Uh, Marcus Vitruvius Polio describes three fundamental principles of what architecture, what great architecture should accomplish. One, Pervatus. It should stand up robustly, it should remain in good condition, it should be durable. This is what we want to see in our websites, right? We want them to be secure, we want them to be stable, we want them to perform. Utilitas. It should be useful and function well for the people who are using it. It should be functional. This is something we want to see in our websites as well. We want them to be usable. We want people to be able to accomplish the things that they need to do. And finally, venue status. It should delight people. It should raise their spirits. It should be beautiful. Another goal that we have in any site that we should build. The site should inspire, should evoke a reaction from people. So... There are parallels, I see. I mean, I know that there are some things that are very different between building a website and building a building, uh, namely longevity. Uh, buildings last a lot longer. A website's not gonna last, you know, for, you know what, what kind of screens are we gonna be viewing our websites on four to five years? We don't get the benefit of dealing with scale, obviously. Um, we're confined to our screens for now. We don't have to worry about physics, thank goodness. Uh, nobody's going to hold us accountable or sue us when things fall apart, hopefully. Um, and we don't have to deal with the environment around us. We are you know, confined to our screens and anything we have to design, the absence of an environment. Uh, one perceived difference between architecture of buildings and architecture of websites is the cost of construction. Um, it takes a lot to, of money to fix a bug when in your house. Uh, the cost of construction, though, five years ago, six years ago, who would have thought that the cost of a website could eclipse the cost of a house? Uh, many of the projects I work on web development are more expensive than my wife's homes and buildings. And she, well, not the big buildings, but personal homes. So in the industry of architecture, documentation has served this role of ensuring that the plan that we're putting together is going to be successful and mitigate their any risks associated with the great cost of construction. Uh, it's hard to undo those problems. And I think that we need to be taking a very similar approach as we approach a website. These are expensive, uh, big investments on behalf of our clients. So documentation matters. It's very important to me, uh, very important to the projects that we work on. Why documentation matters? Just kind of a few points here. Documentation provides a source of clarity. This is one of my favorite quotes. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself, Albert Einstein. Drupal is complex and complicated, and people who are encountering it for the first time, maybe they've heard about Drupal, they've been told that that's what they need to, to use for their site. They shouldn't use WordPress, we should use Drupal. I don't know why, but somebody told me that. Uh, documentation can serve that purpose of providing that clarity, helping them understand uh, and 
from the very beginning, we're starting to teach people not just how to use your website, but how Drupal is put together, how it functions, so that they can use it uh, to the best of their ability. Uh, documentation is a mechanism for accountability. Now, this is extremely important for the success of any project. It helps us to manage our budgets, the scope, scope creep, and manage expectations from the client. So in our documentation, are we keeping track of changes, requests, these kind of things? It also provides a point for us to advocate for project stakeholders. In my role, um, I, we consider my job to be an advocate for the client. Uh, the development team is going to be putting together the best possible plan to build that. Uh, it's my job to make sure that what we're putting together is in line with the client's goals, um, what they need to be accomplished. So it, this provides me a tool to have, perform that kind of advocacy. And finally, documentation can and should be a site of collaboration. Uh, it's not just a matter of me going off into the corner by myself producing a bunch of stuff and just getting sign off on it as much as I can and whenever possible I want to be collaborating with our clients to produce that together to give them a voice in what they're in, in, in defining the direction of the project so we're recording the decisions that are made uh, we're documenting the process of working together and collaborating and this is kind of the evidence of that and when we look back at, on, on the documentation produced we should be able to kind of trace that trail of how we got from point A to point B. So what I want to do in this presentation is just walk through the different types of documents that get produced during a project discovery and to give us some kind of a point of a frame of reference or some context I want to compare that to traditional architecture. Um, again Credit to my wife, she kind of helped me put together examining this process. And I should say it's interesting. In architecture, traditional architecture, there is a clearly defined five-step process that every architect will employ. You learn it in grad school, you get tested on it in your uh, professional licensing exams, and then you do it every day at work. In our industry, every company's got their own approach. Uh, I'm going to be showing my approach, uh, but comparing it to that. And I think it's something, it's, it's a worth, uh, it's a good conversation to have. I know I would never suggest that we standardize that and say that there's one way to go about doing things. Uh, but this kind of one way has emerged in architecture. Um, and well, I don't think that we should adopt that same kind of rigid, rigidity, um, it's something to consider. Well, how, how are we approaching our process? So the first thing, an architect will do on a project is perform what's called a feasibility study. Uh, before any drawings are made, before any decisions are made about what we're building, we'll look at a parcel of land. Um, oftentimes a developer will purchase the land and the first thing they'll do in that feasibility study is say, what can we do with this? Um, how many units could we have in a multi unit multi-family residential building what kind of rent can we charge and how much profit can we make by put building uh, an extra floor here this feasibility study is you know an exploration of what is possible um, and defining you know wh why are we doing this what, did, what what did, what is the whole purpose of this project first thing we'll do in a project is examine the business requirements for the project. So the big question we're asking here is why? Oftentimes, answering an RFP or having a client come to us, you get presented with a 10-page Word document with a list of bullets that have all the features that they want on the site, the, the wish list. Before we start looking at each of those features and looking at um, you know, how can we possibly go about giving the client everything that they need on their wish list, we want to ask the question, why are we doing this? At every turn, when they ask, I want this feature, I want this YouTube integration, why do you want it? What is it accomplishing? Uh, this kind of gets put back to the client in the form of a business requirements document. Uh, in the business requirements document, these are the major things that we want to hit on. Uh, a big purpose of this is just to communicate back to the client that we're on the same page. We want to show a customer profile. So who is this? Do I understand who you are properly? Uh, you know, why are you doing this? What is the strategic initiative that we're trying to accomplish here in, in a two to three sentence paragraph 
can I, can I tell back to the client what they're trying to do? Uh, a problem analysis. What are the problems, what the challenges that they are facing? What, what are the obstacles? Uh, what are they trying to solve with this project? And then from that, the goals and objectives. And I'll say this, the goals we define as high level, hard to measure um, goals for the project. Whereas the objectives we want to state in quantifiable, measurable objectives. So the goal may be to increase the brand, in, uh, the, the reputation of the brand, the, the public perception of the brand through an updated design. An objective may be increase conversion uh, to new user registrations by 20%. Those objectives give us something to measure against at the end of the project. Uh, one thing I'll state too is that this form, uh, these documents that we produce, we want to build on top of each one. At the end, my dream, and I'll say I've never accomplished this yet, but my dream is that all these documents at the end could be bound up, printed off, sent to the client so they can have an archive of that project sitting there on their shelf. How did we get here? The roadmap and as well as all the, the um, technical documentation for any future use. Um, after the goals and objectives, we look at the target audience. We're going to touch back on this later, but who are the people that they're communicating to with their website? Who are the users? Just at a very high level, let's, let's describe these people um, and who the, how they're interacting with them. Define the stakeholders for the project. So the stakeholders are anybody with any sort of investment in this project's success. Uh, that could be users. That could be department members at a university. Um, people who are not necessarily working on the project but have some stake in it. Uh, and then separating those from the actual project team. Uh, any successful project, you want to appoint uh, a single point of contact if possible, or at least a, a few people, uh, so that we can, they can help make those decisions on behalf of the other stakeholders on the project. Reduce the complexity. I worked on one project, um, and the client shall remain unnamed, but they had 90 members on their project team that had to be approved. So getting approval or getting the ability to move forward with anything was impossible. Uh, so defining who are those, those few people that are going to make the decisions on behalf of those stakeholders and documenting that there so that three months from now, when six more people have really strong opinions, you can say, we define you as a member of the project team. Please work with us to help get those people on board or mitigate those decisions. And then finally, timeline and milestones. So at this point, we still haven't defined the feature set, we still haven't defined the approach, but we want to have a general sense of expectations around how long are we going to do, how long is this going to take, what are the major milestones, are there any things that are important to the launch, we need to launch by this date because there's a big event happening, that kind of thing. So we've asked the why. Next thing that we're going to ask is who. Uh, and in who, now we're going back to our target audience and we're going to flesh out how they actually use the site. Yes? I was just curious, is, this, um, is there a order? Is this the order? This is, this is essentially a table of contents for this pers first uh, business requirements document. Yeah. So the first thing that we'll produce, and again, before we define any features or any development plan, this is uh, a document that we're essentially speaking back to the client. Do we understand you? Do we understand the project? Are we all on the same page? Um, you know, they've got it in their head what, the, what, what, what this project is all about. We want to make sure that we can get that out of there uh, and be on the same page. The next step in, you know, after producing this business requirements document, examining the who, is what we'll do a user persona analysis. So, Again, we're still not defining features of a development approach. We're investing this time up front to make sure that we understand this properly. But user personas, if you had a chance, has anybody done these before? Great. Uh, working with clients, this is a wonderful opportunity to actually sit down with your stakeholders. Um, this is where the project team can identify, you know, we want you to talk to this stakeholder group. Say it's a university, but we want to talk to the um, recruiting or the admissions team. We'll talk to them together and perform this workshop where we create these 
fictional characters uh, that are representative of large user groups. And these are the things that we try to accomplish in there. So who are they? What are they like? What are their interests? Um, what are they looking to do uh, on the site? Uh, what are they trying to achieve? Um, and what, what frustrates them? And then we start to define actual tasks. So what, what is Laura wanting to do on the website here? She wants to register for a course. She wants to browse available courses. She wants to see this, the, the times and availability of courses, these kind of things. We define these individual tasks as they relate to our user personas and to sit down with the client and help build this out. This is a, a fun exercise where they can really get their head around it and we can isolate specific user activities. So again, we sit down with them, we perform this workshop and then we produce a document like this. And you know, sometimes you've got six or seven personas, sometimes you've got over 20 personas. Give that back to the client, make sure that we're, you know, what we've talked about, we're all on the same page, we understand. Getting back to real architecture. I shouldn't call it that, but getting back to the architecture of buildings. The next step that an architect would take is the schematic design phase. And this is almost like napkin drawing. You know, we're not defining heights or anything specific, but we're trying to get a concept. We're trying to understand the general parameters of, the, uh, of what we're going to be building. This step, for me, uh, is talking about, we've talked about why, uh, we've talked about who, and this may be a stretch, but we're going to ask where. So they've got a bunch of content, they've got a bunch of stuff that they need on their site, and we're going to start to define where this is all going. If this is a new site, we may uh, not have done uh, a content audit or a site audit, but if we're taking over an old site, we have we've had this chance to hopefully go through the site, identify all the content, and we enter into an information architecture phase where we produce a series of sitemap diagrams, user flow diagrams, and system in integration diagrams. Here we're sketching out just where everything is going and how people are going to get there. This is our, our roadmap. We're not defining functionality, we're just taking inventory of everything and trying to organize it. Again, work with, the, work with our clients on this, produce uh, a, a series of these kind of, di kind of diagrams back to the client in a way that they can understand. Yes? Uh, what is the systems integration diagram? Systems integration diagram would be, um, off, off, if, if, if a Drupal site is just isolated by itself, you know, not integrated with anything else, then we don't have to worry about any kind of systems integration diagram. But if we're integrating with an external database, an external service, we want to just show the points where that integration is going to take place and define them because we're going to have to eventually estimate on what kind of, you know, the cost and the level of effort to, to, to show those integrate or to build those integrations. So we're really just accounting for it here so we have an inventory of everything taking place. Yes? Similarly, the user flow, are you trying to analyze what's being done on the current website that you're replacing or is this something that you're intending? That's a good qu question. I didn't include slides in here for the, the, the site audit, the content audit. Uh, in this case, a user flow diagram would be showing uh, how a user would move through the site in the new proposed. So yes. So some, you're basing that on your user personas, most likely. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So in, in, in the right column of that user personas, they have all those tasks that they want to do. How many clicks is it going to take for them to accomplish that task? Okay. You know? Um, so yes, this is fun. I enjoy this kind of stuff. I get this, this is where I get to kind of go away and start rearranging the Lego blocks and uh, try, trying to make everything fit together and try not to have it too deep, right? That's the ultimate goal. <laughs> um, getting back to the architecture of physical objects, the next step my wife would take would be to enter into the design development phase. So unlike those napkin sketches, here the building is starting to take shape. We don't have specific measurements, we don't have uh, specific requirements about how it's going to be built, but the client can start to see the shape of what they're, they're going to get. Um, we've asked why, we've asked who, we've asked where, and now we're going to ask what. So what is this thing uh, that we're building? We do this in the prototyping phase, and then there's different ways to approach prototyping. Um, 
I've used both OmniGraffle and Axure uh, to produce wireframes. Um, Axure, I prefer uh, if you if we need to actually have a clickable uh, prototype that somebody can kind of click around in. But I prefer to use wireframe because again, this is a presentation on documentation. Well, OmniGraffle just gives you that kind of flexibility to produce my the sitemaps, um, the the wireframes, and as we'll see, build out that document in a, in a shape that we can give to the client. And the second one, how do you spell that? OmniGraffle. A X U R E. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, lets you actually have a kind of hosted prototypes that people can click around in. Um, so yes, here we see uh, in our prototyping phase, things are starting to take shape. You know, we don't have uh, colors, fonts, we don't even have the number, if, if you look here, I've just got boxes of content, and I intentionally here try to keep things at a very, very low fidelity. I don't want to, in this phase, I'm not defining, say, this block has five um, podcasts, we're going to show the title and the uh, date and the author. Um, I just want us to know that the podcast list is going to go here. Uh, and, and that choice to keep things low fidelity is intentional because we want to get buy-in on these kind of high-level priorities. So we're placing stuff on the page, we're rearranging stuff on the page. We don't want to get distracted by the details at this point. So black and white, low fidelity, um, this helps us kind of move forward and we can define further the requirements as we move forward in this process. And the next step in this process, in the architecture of physical objects, construction documents get produced. And here we see we've moved from that low fidelity of a sketch of the building, yeah, I kind of understand what it's going to look like, to measurements, specific details, the specific requirements so that, that a contractor can take these documents and start go about building the document. We've asked why, we've asked who, we've asked what, and now we're asking how. If this is how are we going to actually go about building this. We've taken our low fidelity wireframes. Getting back to that, what I was saying about uh, using OmniGraffle, I, I, I want to be able to produce uh, a document that they can have in their hands. And I'll take those wireframes that we produced in the last phase now and start approaching our functional requirements simply by annotating them. And so we can adjust those boxes now. We can start adding additional uh, information to them, like the number of podcasts in that list, or simply uh, annotate them here with a written description of the what's happening, the fields, the content types, um, with these things. These things that, that comprise Drupal. The features, how, the, how those, those areas are going to work, the content types in play, taxonomies, the views, the modules that are going to power it, any workflows in place, um, you know, publishing workflow, and then finally any integrations, finding the systems integration. Yes? I was curious about your tool here, uh, you can annotate on the boxes of the wireframes. Yeah, yeah, so again, using OmniGraffle, uh, it has a very similar to you know Photoshop layers where I'll create a base layer that has the browser, uh, just by itself, any kind of, you know, headings and titles and that kind of thing. Next layer will have your actual boxes for all of the, to the comprise of the wireframe, and then a third layer of annotations. So you can turn these things on and off to produce different types. Um, one thing that's really important that I've learned, and credit again to my wife, this is language from uh, the industry of architecture, but in defining these functional requirements, um, like I said before, I have a background as a site builder. I understand the architecture of Drupal, uh, I, but I was never a computer science grad, a, a true programmer. You know, I, I can't write PHP. I can maybe copy some PHP snippets and, and just enough to be dangerous, but, um, but I'm not a programmer. And so it's really important to me when I'm putting together this document to define the difference between proprietary specifications and performance specifications. Again, this is a term from the architecture industry, but 
proprietary specification is a very specific specification that must be adhered to. So in this case, in, in thinking of a, uh, a house, a proprietary specification may be, we know that we're going to have a GE model X257 dishwasher, and that is 27 inches wide. So we need to make the cabinet here exactly 27 inches wide. Uh, this is, relates to a specific requirement that must be adhered to. A performance specification allows for um, the contractor, the expert, to use their knowledge, their expertise, in order to find the right solution. So we can say the concrete density uh, needs to be able to withhold 2,500 pounds, hold 2,500 pounds up uh, on that balcony. What type of con concrete we're going to use, uh, where we're going to get that from, that's up to the contractor, but we've set a standard to which it must perform. Uh, in the case of putting together documentation for a website, uh, this could look like we know a proprietary specification is they're using Brightcove for video, and we need to have uh, Brightcove integration that's going to display this, the videos at 540 pixels wide. Um, a performance specification may be uh, we need to get that bright code feed, uh, whether we want to do that via XML, JSON, uh, whatever the best, most efficient way to do that is, I'm going to defer to our development team because that's where their expertise lies. So being able in those annotations to define what is a proprietary specification versus a performance specification allows us to work more efficiently, leveraging individuals' expertise on the team. Um, the final phase in the architecture of physical objects is the contract administration phase. And this is kind of hilarious and outdated in buildings because what this looks like is they've created their construction documents, they've got it approved by the client, they've handed it off to the contractor, the contractor's on site and they're going about building and they inevitably have questions. Um, and the way that is managed is often by faxing back and forth uh, updates to the documentation. They all have a question about this specification, fax it back with some markup on top of that documentation, and then the, ar the architect has to go and update and provide any additional clarity. Thank goodness we're not doing that by fax. Uh, we have the benefit of some more sophisticated tools. What this looks like, in, um, at Achieve at least, is we do uh, our architecture and planning and in all in JIRA. So JIRA, if you guys are familiar, uh, ticket management, agile development. Um, we put we, we sit together with our development team and write out in a, a large architecture and planning document. And this document can be, the last one we produced was like 160 pages, uh, but we're defining all the epics and user stories, development operations plan, development approach, uh, and then the sprint plan and you know major milestones. And, and this is a document that we will share with the client, um, but oftentimes the client says, yeah, this, this looks pretty good. Um, it's a little bit like Greek, uh, but hopefully if we've defined in previous, uh, previous documents and the annotated wireframes and the functional requirements, that's in a, a language that the client can understand. This document, the architecture planning document is for us. We take all those user stories and epics, we dump them into JIRA, we set up our sprints, and then we have, we have the ability to move forward um, with development. And that, that contract administration, instead of having to fax back and forth updates, um, my role, uh, you know, it, the discovery here is hopefully come to a close and moving forward, I get to provide oversight and additional information as required, responding to questions to our developers in JIRA. That is the process of a discovery at Achieve uh, and the process that I've used and learned. Um, any questions? So the uh, wireframe stuff, I have a question. Um, did I, would you say you prefer to stick with like OmniGrapple versus something like Azure? Um, the reason I ask is that what I've been seeing is static wireframes <coughs> problematic because if, if, if the project requires a lot of user interaction, mm -hmm. that's, that, that is not being explained out in a way 
to get approval on. And then the other side of it is sometimes when you do a, one of those um, like with Action or something like that, you have, uh, um, depending on who does it, that can cause problems with the implementing of the approval. So do you, can you just kind of comment on why, what your thoughts are on that? Yeah. Um, part of it comes down for me personally to efficiency and being able to produce things and update things fast. Um, when I'm working in OmniGraffle, it's, a, I can work twice as fast, uh, essentially, and I have kind of more control over the look and feel and the design. Um, depending on the client, uh, project that we just worked on, um, produced about, uh, about 55 wireframes, uh, and we did it in OmniGraffle, and the project team that we were working with, we had three members who were the primary points of contact, but ultimately the decision was going to be made by the president of the company. Uh, and what we were able to do by using OmniGraffle, and again, this is the credit to my wife, but, but we produced, what I did was I took, took the, the, uh, the document, printed it out on 18 by 24 inch paper, staple bound and strip bound on the side, mailed it to the client um, uh, and so that they could take it to the president, put it on the desk, and they have this physical representation of what they're going to be working with. Now, uh, that was amazing. They loved it. And for that, for that stakeholder there to be able to pour through it and read it like a document, it was wonderful. Uh, you could very little feedback because it, kind of, it was a real source of clarity for them. Now, what you're describing about like sites with high functionality, what we've done uh, in the past is use something like, not necessarily Axure, but something like Bootstrap to quickly prototype a piece of functionality on the site. If there's a specific like complex interaction that can't be described in static wireframes, we'll try to do that as a kind of a proof of concept in order to get buy-in. Um, again, Axure is great and... Uh, I just find that my time, the amount of effort and energy that you have to put into it often kind of doubles um, in, order, in order to, when you have to update your links between things and that kind of stuff. I've never used it, but I've been working on a project where uh, their in-house user experience versus building out a specific concept in action, and then I'm trying to implement that in Google, and that was uh, you know, a little problem. This, I think, what you're touching on here too has to do, like, relates to that difference between low fidelity and high fidelity, and and as best we can keeping the the the, the fidelity of these wireframes as low as possible, so that we can build it out in Drupal in a way that leverages the development team's expertise. Uh, if we build something out in Axure that's too interactive, too like too close to a website, it kind of can play with or ruin expectations on the client. So being able to um, to show the physical representation of static wireframe and describe the interaction um, and describe the kind of the fields and what what's going how the interaction is going to take place, um, it's like reading a book. It lets your imagination go. Um, and then it you know, fits in with our process there. Uh, yes? When you do wireframes, do you, <clears throat> do you always do the uh, desktop, tablet, phone? Do you do them three times? Do you do three versions of each? Sometimes four. So like sometimes a, uh, a, a tablet landscape right. version. Uh, sometimes a tablet landscape version is so close to the desktop version that it's not necessary. <clears throat> I probably should be doing phone landscape, but uh, doesn't always happen. <laughs> yeah. Could you um, describe the process more about going from schematic design where you have your, you know, your user flow to the functional requirements where you say, okay, in order for the user to get from here to here, we need to have these taxonomies and these features. Like how do you, how, how much of that discovery did you do beforehand? Sure. Uh, in that information architecture phase, that's typically where we'll, you know, define the navigation, the, like let's say the, the way somebody's going to move through the site, and in there too, um, do we don't always have a sense of the taxonomies? Um, you know, we're focused on navigation, so unless it's an area of the site where 
navigation is dependent on the taxonomy in, in some way. Uh, we're not necessarily defining all the taxonomies at that point. Um, in terms of like that transition from information architecture to wireframing, their information architecture gives us that inventory of everything, the kind of structure on the site. And probably the, the first wireframe that I'll produce, um, you know, the, the wireframe that we sh I showed up there, I think might have been the home page. Uh, before I'll produce a home page or any kind of sub pages, I'll just have a, a, a header and sidebars or a navigation wireframe. So getting sign off on that first from the client, we're defining these are the navigation patterns on the site. This is our secondary navigation, where it would appear and how it's structured uh, before we move into actual main content area. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, there's just like all the parts of the Google site that you end up having to eventually use, like a company has to go, okay, we need to have these things to get started. Just that's kind of where I'm just stuck at right now, I guess. Sure. Yeah. The, again, I, the, the information architecture is that inventory phase there. So, um, again, sometimes we will have full lists of, of taxonomies, but those are typically defined in the functional requirements. So we'll have an inventory of all the content types, all the taxonomies related to that, any kind of entity references or ways that content is related in there. Um, defining that, and oftentimes for the client's perspective, like, what you're describing is kind of getting into the weeds of Drupal and they don't really care so long as it works. Um, so that's a bit of a back and forth between me and the development team as opposed to getting signed off on like, you know, you, you want them to understand that this is an entity reference as a way for two pieces of content to be related to each other, but they don't care that it's what it, they don't, they don't know what an entity is and they don't really care, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, you know, it, 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 this is one of those areas where it can be a performance specification. So how do we want to, um, how do we want to, for, in, in a recent site, we had a resource centers on the site that had tens of thousands of PDFs. Um, how are we going to get, give them the ability to add a new PDF and put it within this very complex navigation structure? Um, when I started on that project, uh, or started on that process, I didn't have the best idea as to like, how are we gonna do that? Is we do it with taxonomy? You know, are these PDFs gonna be a content type or are they gonna be an entity? Um, I just was able to describe the, the how it was gonna function to the client, to show that in the wireframe, and then work with our development team to be what is the best approach here. I, I, it doesn't serve us well for me to kinda over-define things for the team because then they're going to they're, they're going to laugh at me uh, <laughs> and say that that's that's stupid, um, or they're going to have to undo some of that work and kind of I don't want to go too far down a path that's that's not the best direction. Correct. Do you have notes also? Because I find that your speaking notes are a lot more like, have a lot more information. I don't have notes currently. I know that the um, there's a, this is recording, and so you'll have a access oh, to a recording. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somehow, some way. <laughs> she hates that I put her picture at the front of the so she, <laughs> I'm going to hear about it when I get home. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, Great question. Uh, so at Edgy, we don't actually do design in-house. You know, like I kind of mentioned at the beginning, we're primarily a Drupal engineering firm. Uh, but we work with design firms and contract designers to do that. Um, what happens, and we're just entering design phase on a project right now with the wireframes you saw, um, after the wireframes and functional requirements have been built out, you know, before that, before, while the development team is starting to work through the architecture and planning phase, um, that's when we'll take our, our wireframes and requirements to the design team and work through that. So we have a separate process there where 
depending on the design team that we're working with, you know, they usually have their own design survey, kind of a, a, a mini design discovery that we separate off into a different phase. Um, and they'll be basing that on the wireframes that are produced there, uh, as well as the business requirements and you know, the, the uh, <coughs> goals and objectives as they relate to the brand image and that kind of thing. Do you always start with do things in this order? Do you find you have clients who have designs and they come to you to get the site built afterwards? So this this is the ideal order uh, what what I described there. Um, but inevitably, yeah, we'll have we'll have people who come to us with wireframes together and site maps together, um, design concepts or their own internal designer, and so we have to be flexible uh, in how we approach that. Um, I'd say that even when a, a client comes to us with information architecture, site maps, wireframes, we want to perform uh, an expedited or micro discovery in order to ensure that. You know what they're describing adheres to Drupal best practices for development. Um, if there's any insight that we can offer about usability and different approaches, um, you know we don't want to just take what they have at face value and start going about building that because we want to leverage the expertise of our own team. Uh, yes. Will the design firm you use do they ever have feedback that would change the wireframes? The, the 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 design team will change the wireframes I produced. I was saying, will they ever have feedback on the wireframes? Yes. Uh, what I mean again, touching on the idea of high fidelity versus low fidelity, the wireframes that I'll produce uh, again, you you saw that the detail was in the writing in the annotations, the actual blocks of content very low fidelity, and I want to be able to give them to that in that state. So again, we're, when we're doing the architecture and planning phase, we're leveraging the expertise of the development team. When we head into design, I want to leverage the expertise of that designer. So I have a, a written description of how this block of content is going to function. Um, and in terms of the layout and display, I don't want to say we want the date on top and then the title and then the author's name. I, I, I want to you know, let that designer have room to be creative, uh, leverage their expertise. And so, yes. To answer your question, absolutely, feedback comes at that stage, and we have to work with the client there as well. You know, the, there's a whole, this design phase being totally separate gives us that chance to produce additional documentation um, that, that involves the client in that conversation, and we do that with the designer. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you mean like a content modeling kind of workshop? Well, something of them where I take like all the content that they have on the site or that they're supposed to have, mm -hmm. and I say just take all these things and lay them out in stacks that are logically you know, uh, similar, and then label that stack something that kind of helps me get get any of the information to move up. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, that's not something that I have incorporated into my practice. It's that sounds like a really good exercise. I mean, one thing similar to that is it, when it, the first thing I thought of, we'll do like a content modeling workshop where we'll put pieces of content on cards and start rearranging them, uh, you know, paste them on a wall to kind of rearrange the priority of content in the page. That helps us produce the wireframes because uh, we're, you know, what what is most important here. But that's a great. That's a what you're describing is sounds like a really good exercise. That that I think. Typically, I've done not to say that's the right way, the best way to do it, but done that in the information architecture content audit uh, phase there, and done that in OmniGraphle. Um, I'm getting the evil eye from our marketing <laughs> coordinator because I forgot to hand out T-shirts. Does anybody want a T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, whoever whoever asked, so we. Uh, Where'd you buy that shirt? <laughs> you asked a couple of good questions. You asked a couple of good questions. <laughs> oh. I, I I can't guarantee sizes here, guys. <laughs> Who can fit into a small? 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and I got one last medium. I'll trade. Can I trade? Yeah. <laughs> so what do I have now? Large. Uh, large. The covenant large, large in the back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, medium. You want to trade for a Sorry, Ben. Well done. <laughs> any last questions or any suggestions? Like, I appreciate the, um, the suggestion there. Any any other things that you guys have seen that has been successful in the in this process? I like that it, it had not occurred to me in terms of wireframes to use um, different layers. Usually I use InDesign, um, but it has the same layering functionality in order to keep track of the different levels of detail that I don't need to show people yet. Yeah. And one uh, image that I didn't show, uh, that in, in the, you know, touching on the whole idea of layering, in the... Um, do, do, do. In the information architecture phase here, this is a very high level information architecture diagram site map here showing the primary navigation, the utility navigation, and then uh, the, this is a resource center navigation that this site had. So this is kind of a very high level for them to kind of understand the site. The resource center navigation that we're describing here at the bottom, the actual site map for all of the content that was in there was probably... 150 boxes because it was just a very complex, deep um, navigation. In terms of layering, well, one kind of important step in this process is I'll add, I got, a, I got a one box that says, you know, this is what this page or this view is. And then when we're starting to define the different content types that are required on the site, I'll put another little box in the corner on a separate layer uh, with a, a color and a number both a color and a number because black and white documents, you can't tell the difference between the color. But a, and then you have a legend for all the different template types or display types or content types so that you can, you can give them a version of that site map that just shows, you know, what are the different pages and how can we move through? And then you turn on the legend layer and for the development team and for them to kind of understand it, they get to see, okay, these are all resource list displays, and these are all basic pages, and these are forms. Uh, so you have that annotation there, you know, defining the different content types. I should have had that image. I'll add that to the next time I get this. Cool. Thank you so much for your time, guys. So you should show this at your next, uh, your next dinner or your... <laughs> yes, give me just give me fifty minutes and that'll <laughs> pull up on your phone and just do a demo. Right? Listen, with all of them with their student debt, there's no convincing them that I'm allowed to call myself a architect. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> San Diego and Chula Vista. Oh, anyway, my name's Chuck. Nice to meet you. I love this. Now, you said you're going to be putting this up? Yeah, we, we recorded. Actually, I should probably actually stop that. Now, is this going to be on your site? Or is it going to 